Afternoon Theatre. Here am I. Where are you? A play by Sheila Hodgson, based on an idea by M. R. James, with David March as James. Here am I. Where are you? is a most wasteful business. A man has only to reach middle years to find himself surrounded by impedimenta, the wreckage of unsuccessful plans, interrupted friendships, and the first notes for some magnificent idea which has never been followed up, and all too plainly never will be now. Worst of all, the outline for so many stories which I shall quite simply never have time to write. Take this mug, for example. There is really a rather horrid story concerning... Uh, oh, just a minute. Let me close my desk. What was I saying? Oh, of course, the mug. I had been working on a book about the early English Bibles, and in the course of my research had called on a certain Professor Zetterholm who, as I recall it, lived at Greenwich. Good morning, sir. Ah, good morning. I have an appointment with Professor Zetterholm. My name is Dr. James. Oh, oh, thank goodness. Oh, do come in, Doctor. I said it was high time he did something. I told Cook if he doesn't do something, I good mind to speak to the law. Uh, uh, excuse me. and it's against nature, too. Now, will you see the child straight away? I beg your pardon. You are a doctor. I am the provost of kings, madam. I am Montague James, and I have an appointment. Oh. Oh, you're not a real doctor, then? <laughs> oh, dear, dear, that's a terrible disappointment. Oh, well, you better come in, I suppose. Thank you. Now, follow me. I'll be careful, sir, in case there's a tripwire across the hall. Bless my soul. Oh, just a minute. My dear lady, I cannot have heard you correctly. Well, I hope I didn't defend you, sir, but it was a natural mistake under the circumstances. <sighs> oh, dear. Old Cook will be upset when I tell her. Now, will you wait in here, please? She left me in an oak-panelled room, furnished with squat leather armchairs and a vast quantity of books. I walked over to examine these and was startled to hear a violent scream from the other side of the wall. followed a crash, as if some heavy object had struck the floor. And then, silence. To say I felt surprised would be a considerable understatement. When visiting a distinguished man of letters, one does not generally expect... Well? Yes? Who are you? Uh, Professor Zetterholm. What is it? What do you want? I wrote to you, sir. Montague James, you did me the honour of suggesting... Ah, uh, you're that fellow from Cambridge. Uh, yes. I've heard about you, quite a reputation. All right, sit down. I've got half an hour I can give you before my lunch. You invited me to lunch? Eh? Oh, damn. Oh, never mind, I expect the chair can be mended. I beg your pardon. Oh, sit down for heaven's sake. What's the matter? <laughs> Oh, I suppose I'd better apologise for my appearance. I hope I had not been staring, but really the professor's appearance did call for some explanation. The sleeve of his jacket had been torn, the tie twisted round and lay beneath his right ear, 
while a peanut seemed to be entangled in his pale, gingery hair. As time might be short, I began to explain the purpose of my visit. I wanted to examine the Red Book of Eye, a Saxon manuscript he had in his collection. In the middle of displaying this treasure, he looked at me sharply and said, Write ghost stories, don't you? Uh, well, yes, uh, I have had some small success. Extraordinary thing for an adult man to do. He blinked, evidently feeling that I ranked in curiosity a second only to the Red Book of Eye. <laughs> he reached up and produced that remarkable document. The parchment appeared to be stained with seawater. While I made notes and struggled to decipher the archaic Latin, he suddenly leant across and hissed. You know the legend, of course. Yes. You do? It belonged, I believe, to the monks of Dunwich, who lost their monastery when the tide swallowed up the land in uh, 800 AD. How did you come by it? It's a rare treasure. <laughs> I have my methods, sir. The Saxons held that anyone who swore on the Red Book of Eye and broke that oath would run mad. I heard another story connected with the monks. Indeed. I heard when one of them became father to an illegitimate child, he took it to the shore below high watermark and left it there to drown. Good heavens! What a singularly nasty tale. <laughs> the coastline must have been littered with little corpses in those days, don't you think? Upon my word, I decline to consider any such repulsive nonsense. James, James, do you hate children? Do I? Bless my soul. No, I do. Oh, come, come, come. They're not human, you know. Sly, malicious, Animals. Good heavens! I have had a grave misfortune, you know. My sister and her husband were recently killed in a railroad accident. Oh, dear me. I am exceedingly sorry. She married a Canadian, against my advice. I need hardly say. As a result, there are no relations in this country. There is no one to be responsible for their repellent son but me. I have had to take Paul Mallory into my own home. I've had to accept a child of ten years old. <laughs> Can you imagine what it means? Ah. Oh, what the oh, devil is this? To my astonishment, there appeared at the window a masked face. A black object which grinned and bobbed while two hands made derisive gestures. Fairly shrieking with God, rage, Professor Zetterholm threw up the window and hauled the figure inside. Rich monster! Take off that mask! No! Apologize at once, you little devil! John! You were frightened! You were frightened! Get out! What's that silly old book? If you dare to touch that book... The book? Oh, yes, the book. Do you want to look at the book, Paul? Can I? Of course. Take it. Hold it tight. That's right. It's a remarkable book, Paul. It belonged to some very learned monks in the ninth century. Oh. They put a curse on it. Do you know what a curse is? Um. Anyone who touches those pages will go mad. Slowly, of course. His brain will rot. He'll see horrible visions, and finally... <laughs> oh, dear, dear, dear. Wasn't that a little unnecessary? <laughs> what a pity he's run away. He's run up a tree. Oh, yes. Yes, he does that every time to escape me. He climbs up into the oak and sits there grinning. <laughs> uh, shall we continue our studies? Uh, where's the book? Here. Ah. Thank you. Now, my translation of Abhosti Dockery... Oh, no, 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 sir. I, I think Master Paul's having hysterics. Then I suggest you throw a bucket of ice-cold water he's over him. He's gone up to that tree again and he's crying. Little boys must learn not to be crybabies. Oh, with all due respect, sir, you didn't know how to do it. You 
Don't drive the poor creature mad. And what do you think he's doing to me, pray? He's only ten, Lord love him. All right, all right. I swear to cherish the boy like his own parents. Now get out. But, sir, please... Is me... lunch ready? Not quite, sir. In five minutes. Since you dislike children so much, it would surely be common sense to make some other arrangement. I have no money and I have a duty, I suppose. Oh, careful. What? You are clutching the Red Book of Eye. Please, please, you may tear the parchment. You see? You see to what extremes this little monster has driven me. Allow me to put it back on the shelf. You're right, of course. Oh, yes. I was brought up in an orphanage. And yes, I... I do not care for children. They used to laugh at me because I had to wear spectacles. And because I happened to be fond of books. Cookie's ready to serve lunch now, sir. Then tell her to get on with it. We're waiting. I doubt if I have ever spent a more uncomfortable meal. Uncle and nephew sat glowering at each other across the tablecloth. After a while, I noticed a curious phenomenon. Professor Zetter Holmes' dish of cold meat kept wobbling up and down. I have scant acquaintance with the ways of children. My little goddaughter is not given to such tricks. But I had no doubt that what I was watching was a plate lifter which could be bought in any good joke shop for a few pence. I slipped my hand under the tablecloth, and, yes, I was right. My fingers encountered a thin rubber tube. What's the matter, Uncle? Don't you feel well? It must be the heat. It's awfully hot in here. Oh, be quiet! Your face has gone a funny colour. It's a, a plate lifter, Professor Zeta Holm. Don't worry, I beg you. You, you evil <laughs> little monkey! Get rid of that blasted contraption! Zeta Holm pulled at the tube, sending several dishes crashing to the floor. He yelled for Mrs. Marriott, who scuttled in and removed the shattered remains of a rather fine royal Dalton vegetable dish. We continue to eat in an atmosphere thick with ill-concealed hatred. Halfway through the meat course, the boy turned pale, coughed, <laughs> turned red, and then fled from the dining room. <coughs> Paul, what's the matter? Don't distress yourself, Dr. James. Uh, do sit down. I think that child is ill. Yes, I'm sure of it. What shouldn't we find out? Quite unnecessary, I assure you. I put a small additive into his meat. I have every hope that at this moment he's been rather sick. Oh, but we can finish our meal in peace. Now, concerning the monks of Dunwich. It really seemed to me that the learned professor was every bit as childish and vindictive as his nephew. I could scarcely wait to finish my notes and escape from the house. You, you work fast, James. Yes, I've nearly finished, thank goodness. I'm most grateful for your cooperation, Zeta Holm. You have a splendid library here. Uh, worth a small fortune. I don't just collect books, you know. Uh, let me show you another hobby. Uh, I acquired this at Sotheby's yesterday. A very fine specimen. Mm. Oh, careful. Pale green china. Uh, what is it? 18th century. A frog tank. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, I've seen them before. There's a small carved frog inside, isn't there? Mm -hmm. Ah, yes, I thought so. The idea being that when you fancied you saw the creature move, you would have enough to drink. You don't think the frog actually moved? My dear fellow, how could it? The frog is made of nothing but clay, a combination of chemical matter. Yet a man moves, and he's nothing but a combination of chemicals. Rubbish! Uh, I beg your pardon, how very rude of me. Uh, you ignore the spirit. Not at all. I merely ask you, sir. If the spirit moves one, why not the other? Uh, I can see no logical reason. I... 
By God, it's a hulk. The tankard, it's gone. That damnable child. And indeed, while we had been engaged in these rather specious arguments, Paul had leant in through the window and taken the tankard from the sill where I had placed it. I could see him running away across the grass. Zetterholm gave a positive bellow of fury, and to my astonishment, for he must have been at least seventy, leapt through the open window and set off in frantic pursuit. I followed at a more leisurely pace, and via the door. I caught up with him at the far end of the garden. Uh, uh, he's in there. What's this? Some kind of maze? Come out! I'll skin you alive, you poisonous little thief! Oh. Come out! I know where you are. I'll find you. <laughs> I warn you for the last time. I'll get you. And my God, when I do... And he disappeared behind the laurel bushes. I entered the labyrinth myself. I don't know what previous owner had designed the thing. It clearly held no interest for the professor and had been suffered to turn into a monstrous tangle of uncut hedges, a crisscross pattern of choked and dusty paths. I found him in a cul-de-sac, scarlet in the face, and breathing with difficulty. Oh, oh, where is he? I'll strangle the boy once I get my hands on him. Here I am. Over there, quick. My dear sir, do calm yourself. Settle oh. home. Uh. You cannot possibly claw your way through a privy gate. Uh, Stop it, my dear fellow. Uh, oh, don't. Well, he's there. Uh, help me. I, I refuse to do anything of the sort. Oh, be reasonable. Bless my soul, what are you thinking of? Let me get through. Nonsense. Even if you succeed in breaking a hole, which strikes me as exceedingly unlikely, the child will have gone long before you can climb through to the other side. I mean no disrespect, but you are not young, sir, and neither am I. In the name of sanity, let us rest. Oh, forgive me. I apologize. I'm not myself. It is, if I may say so, a grave mistake to become so excited over trifles. What, that? Trifles? He's got my precious frog tank. Which he will certainly drop and break if you continue to pursue him in this headlong fashion. He destroyed my essay on St. Wolfram, deliberately poured ink across it. He mixed the pages of my index. It'll take days to repair the damage. He sits high in that oak branch, mocking me. I see. Yes. Good heavens, you had better make some other arrangement for your nephew, whatever it may cost. This manifestly cannot go on. I've always detested children. Listen. Where are you? <laughs> He's in the center of the maze. We'll catch him. You take that path. I'll take the other. Oh, hurry, hurry, hurry. Set a hole. Set a hole. Do come back. There is utterly no point. Oh, bless my soul. And I came here to work. Paul? Paul, this is Dr. James. Do stop your nonsense, my dear boy. I know where you are. You're lost. I know where you are. You're the other side of the hedge and behaving very stupidly. Now, have you got the tankard there? Shan't tell you. Oh, dear, dear, dear. Dr. James! Yes, I'm here. You didn't catch him? I'm afraid not. Oh, hell and damnation! The place. It is certainly highly confounding. I have rarely lost my sense of direction so completely. Oh, I see you have a sundial in the middle. What does it say? Lente, lente, curiti, noctis equi. Hmm. 
slowly, slowly gallop the horses of the night. Good heavens, a slightly threatening inscription. Yes. Curious. The inscription is uh, fairly modern, you know. It has obviously been carved on the base at a later date. The sundial, on the other hand, is very old indeed. Bless my soul. Come away. No, wait, please. Have you never observed? Gracious me, this is quite extraordinary. It is cold. I must ask you to hurry. But look, the sundial is wrong. Oh, what nonsense is this? See for yourself. At that angle, it would not, could not show the correct hour. Oh, odd. And your interpretation? Incredible. It must have been constructed at a time when the sun occupied a different position in the heavens. I have heard such theories. And so have I. The, the world is full of people who believe in higher lunacy. Oh. <laughs> Let's get out of here. Mrs. Marriott? Mrs. Marriott! Good afternoon, sir. Are you ready for your tea yet? Uh, where is he? Bring him out. I beg your pardon, sir. The boy! Oh, oh, it's Master Paul in the house. I've no idea. I'll what... find him. Where are you, Paul? Has there been some trouble, sir? Uh, nothing serious, I assure you. Oh, gracious. It's very unsettling. They don't understand each other, I'm afraid. I mean, the Master and Master Paul, they don't see eye to eye if you follow me. With which masterpiece of understatement, she picked up her skirts and fled. I entered the library, sat against the window, and endeavoured to compose my thoughts. But I defy anybody to concentrate whilst the house about him reverberates with shrieks, yells and curses, stamping feet, slamming doors and female weeping. From my vantage point, I presently beheld a tableau vivant. Master Paul came rushing out of the front entrance, followed by Zetterholm brandishing a heavy stick. The child fled across the lawn, making for his favourite tree, squealing derisively as he went. He teetered like a monkey, grabbed the swaying bough above his head, sprang forward and... Dear God! Oh, no! No, no! What's happened? The boy has fallen. Oh, is he hurt? I very much fear. Oh, I knew it. Oh, my poor lamb. Is he bad? Is he in pain? Run, run, Emily, run and fetch the doctor. He was not in pain. That, at least. He lay bent at the foot of the great oak, his small body twisted into a strange, doll-like position. And he was dead. I left the house as soon as I decently could. I left them sending messages for the doctor, the local priest, and I know not what superfluous figures of authority, all of whom would manifestly arrive too late. I left them, yet out of all that confusion, one picture remained in my mind's eye. With horrid clarity, I saw Paul lying dead on the ground, whilst his uncle stood motionless beside him, leaning on his stick and smiling. For my part, I returned to Cambridge. You're glad to be back there. Uh, most heartily. A terrible experience, Guthrie. I entertain the gravest doubts of that man's sanity. And so do I. Good Lord, why in heaven's name should he torment a child? Oh, the dark springs of human behavior, my dear fellow. I've seen it eaten, the white face of some little boy bullied by his classmates. And I have wondered what foundations are being laid in that mind, what trouble is being prepared at a later date for somebody else, hmm? Uh, excuse me, sir. There's a Professor Zeta home asking for you. I beg your pardon? Well, he's downstairs, sir. He seems very anxious to see you, sir. Tell Professor Zeta home that I regret a uh, pressure of work. Oh, no, no. Confound it. I can't say that. He's come all the way from London. Oh, you'd better send him in. Yes, sir. I'll go. No. If you value our friendship, my dear Guthrie, you will stay precisely where you are. I shall find it in very poor taste if you dare to... 
Professor Zetterholm, sir. <laughs> My dear Zetterholm, this is an unexpected pleasure. Uh, you're in Cambridge on business. Uh, no, uh, yes, uh, uh, not precisely. <laughs> Uh, may I introduce uh, Mr. Anstey Guthrie, Professor Zetterholm? Oh, how do you do, sir? I've heard of you, of course. Uh, oh, indeed? In, in what context? Uh, I have been telling uh, Mr. Guthrie of your famous library, uh, your other antiques, the, the uh, frog tankard, and, uh, uh, of course, the recent uh, appalling tragedy. May I offer you my profound sympathy, sir? A terrible calamity. Uh, yes, it is, and... Uh, uh, how in the name of hell is it happening? I beg your pardon. He is buried, Professor Setterholm. I feel for you. You blame yourself, no doubt, but uh, the past, unfortunately, cannot be recalled. Exactly. It, it, it is not possible. I saw the coffin lowered myself, and the earth dropped down. I must advise you not to dwell on such a melancholy subject. If it's on your mind, sir, you could see a priest. Uh, exorcism, you mean? No. I thought he might be able to comfort you. Is there a religious ceremony? Do you, do you know any suitable clergyman? But I understood you had been present at the funeral. You, you find me absurd. Yes, you're right. Uh, and it could all be imagination. But tell me this. Do you, a man of some experience and learning, do you believe an inanimate object can move? Oh, dear me. Or you, sir. Uh, what's your name, Guthrie? Well, uh, I shouldn't care to commit myself. There is a German theory, uh, poltergeists, don't they call them? My dear fellow, you have evidently got some distressing problem on your mind. It is quite impossible to comment without knowing the full story. Now, if you would care to give us the details... No. What's the point? Anyway, I refuse to believe it. You were speaking of poltergeists. <laughs> you'd laugh at me. <laughs> yes, you'd find it very comic, no doubt. Good day, Dr. Uh, James. Professor Zetterholm, I, I do assure you, neither of us would be so ill-mannered as to laugh. And since you have travelled all the way up to Cambridge to speak to me, you really cannot go without explaining... <laughs> he can, you know. Oh, dear, dear, dear. What's the matter with a fellow? Hang it, what an extraordinary way to behave. There he goes, striding across the quad. Yes. Yes. As a matter of curiosity, Guthrie, what impression did you get? Of him? Well, the man has no manners and may be slightly mad, as you suggested. Ah. I have changed my mind. Why? Guthrie, he's not a lunatic. Do you know, I get the impression that Professor Zetterholm is very, very frightened. Come in. The post, sir. Oh, thank you. Uh, just put the letters on that table, will you? Sir. All right. The man did seem distinctly nervous, but why on earth? Yes, since he will not tell us, we are unlikely to find out. Bless my soul, how very odd. Bad news? No, no, I simply happened to notice the postmark on this letter. It comes from Greenwich. Oh, good heavens. Oh, no, oh, surely not. Oh, dear me. Oh, James. I beg your pardon. Uh, this is from the housekeeper, Mrs. Marriott. Oh, how very disturbing. What does she want? Dear Dr. James, I hope I'm addressing you correct, seeing as how you're not a proper medical gentleman. I wouldn't take the liberty, only I got your address, and Cook can't think of anybody else. Isn't that a nice complimentary opening? No, listen. He, underlined, she must mean Zetterholm, he is getting worse. At first, Cook said he was mental, but now agrees with me there is something in the house. Something in the house? Are we back on poltergeist? Anyway, it's not human, sir, and Cook has heard the voice. Good Lord. <laughs> this really is the most illegible handwriting. Andrew has contrived to spill ink over the second page. <laughs> we think... That is, Cook and me, we think some gentleman like yourself ought to look into it. 
being as there is some ugly rumours in the town and it's not nice for the staff. What can she mean? I wonder. A lot of backstairs gossip. I shouldn't bother to reply. For a moment I thought you were upset. I am. Oh, come. By that. It's the postscript, you see. Oh, dear heaven, there's more. At the bottom, after her signature, Mrs. Marriott writes, P.S. And what about the tree? That's what I says. I beg your pardon? Mr. Verrill, who does the garden here, examined the tree most careful, and he says the branch was sawn through. But... Oh, no. If someone had cut through the branch deliberately, knowing the boy's habits... It would be murder. Yes. Do you believe he did it? Dear Lord, he stood there smiling, you know. It's the devil of a situation. Nevertheless, a plan occurs to me. Are you particularly fond of frog tankards? What? I'm certain you are. Yes? Yes, in fact, you collect them, frog tankards. For I know for a fact he possesses one of these. Now, suppose you were to ask me, my dear fellow, where you could see a rare 18th century frog tankard. Why, I should naturally escort you to the house of my acquaintance in Greenwich. <laughs> Have you any particular engagements for next Tuesday? So we arrived on a wet afternoon, unannounced, to be greeted by Mrs. Marriott with near hysterical relief. Oh, oh, oh it's you. Oh, oh, thank goodness. It's getting worse, Doctor. It happens in the daylight now. Do be calm, Mrs. Marriott. Uh, this is my friend, Mr. Guthrie. Hey, good day, Now, Mrs. if you could bring yourself to explain. Well, he's laughing. And, and things dropped out of the shelf. It's against nature. You ask Cook. And sometimes it feels like cobwebs touching your face. And so cold. Even with the fire going, you never felt nothing like the cold. Is it Marriott? Oh, don't tell him I wrote. Please, please, sir. Who is it? The doctor, sir. And somebody else. I was shocked by the change in his appearance. He had always looked slightly bizarre, unkempt, uncared for. But now his clothes hung about him and the staring eyes were sunk in the dark hollow of his cheeks. I am not entirely sure what kind of reception I had expected from Zetterholm. Certainly not the one we got. Dr. James. Oh, thank God, thank God. You'll stay to dinner, uh, and your friend as well. Uh, there are two of you, that's even better. Uh, you must stay the night, I insist. Oh, but, uh, uh, Mrs. Marriott, prepare the spare room for these gentlemen. We are simply uh, passing through Greenwich. Give me your coat. It, it may rain, you can't possibly continue in this weather. Uh, Mrs. Marriott, light fires in the guest rooms and air the beds. Yes, sir. The weather is quite clement, I assure you. We had no intention of foisting ourselves upon oh, you. Oh, good Lord, no. Uh, sit down. Uh, I can offer you brandy. Uh, don't trouble yourself about night attire, gentlemen. I have several pairs of pajamas. Oh, you must stay as long as possible. Bless my soul, this is a casual visit, sir. We happen to be near your house, that's all. Yes. Oh, thank heaven. Oh. You must stay at least three days, I beg oh, you. But I, I have uh, some new books in the library, Dr. James. You, you'll want to look at those, eh? And, and we might pass the time playing cards. Uh, uh, billiards. Uh, uh, perhaps your friend is interested in the garden. I'm much obliged, but we really don't want to impose on your hospitality. I am expected back in Cambridge before the end of term. And we wouldn't dream of upsetting your housekeeping arrangements. Oh, there's plenty of food. That's not the problem. Uh, what miracle brings you here? Yeah, yeah, my friend Guthrie happens to be interested in uh, 18th century frog tank. Oh, yes. And by my description of your remarkable sundial. Even as I spoke the carefully prepared lies, I became uncomfortably aware that they were superfluous. Professor Zetter Holmes simply did not care what accident had brought us to Greenwich. He didn't mind why Guthrie and I were so unaccountably on his doorstep. He was hell-bent on keeping us there. I viewed dinner with some concern, and so did Guthrie. He was mortally afraid he might have to talk about antiques. 
You uh, collect frog tankards, you say? Uh, I have a frog tankard. Uh, really? Uh, yes, uh, though uh, where it is at the moment... Uh... Ah! Is something wrong, sir? No, certainly not. No! You'll have to excuse me. Is he drunk? Hardly. He doesn't touch wine. And I have myself been fairly moderate, but for a moment I could have sworn. Guthrie, is his plate moving? His plate? No, of course not. Imagination. And besides, the boy is dead. My dear friend, can we leave in the morning early? Is the place haunted, in your opinion? Hmm? Only by our slightly insane host. Where's he gone? I really cannot imagine. Oh, dear me. This is ridiculous. Do we go on eating dinner or what? You can see the tree from that window. Dark against the clouds. Sit down. It would be interesting to examine the branches. For heaven's sake, you're not proposing to climb a tree in the middle of the night. Nor at any other time, I assure you. But if we could lay hands on a talk... Sit down. He may come back at any time. I suggest an early bed. I will meet you by the side entrance at 10.30. <clears throat> you must excuse me, gentlemen. I'm not well. My digestion is not all that it might be. I fear. Did you get a torch? Yes. I persuaded the good Mrs. Marriott that torches were an integral part of ghost hunting. Which tree was it? The oak. Be careful how you flash the light. They're quite certainly visible from the house. I can see a broken stump. Broken? Or cut through? Impossible to tell. Well, surely the police would have examined it. It's high up. They may have accepted Setter Holmes word. The boy was known to climb repeatedly. A fall might seem natural. But the branch may have been destroyed, I fear, smashed underfoot in the general confusion by accident or design. Who's there? <gasps> Who is it? Oh, my God. All right, all right. Good evening, Professor Setter Holmes. I regret uh, we found it quite impossible to sleep. Be honest with me, sir. What have you seen? Seen? A figure, wasn't it? In the moonlight. A body scrambling about in the branches. No, I promise you, my dear sir, these are the wildest imaginings. Oh, yes. Forgive me. Um, can I offer you a nightcap? It has grown cold. The morning found Zetterholm in a curiously defiant mood. He came upon me in the library and grasped my shoulder. Listen. Oh, oh, I have remembered. I know where my frog tankard is. Oh, capital. It's in the maze. Ah. You think it was left behind there when... Yes. Uh, then perhaps you would prefer to forget the whole transaction. Well, there are painful memories. No doubt Guthrie will understand. I refuse to be mocked. I'm a man of some standing, sir. A certain reputation. So-called manifestations cannot affect... A... <laughs> cannot touch anyone with pretensions to intelligence quite so perhaps you'll come with me into the maze I dislike wasting time it would be stupid to get lost again and your friend oh yes nothing can happen if there are three of us can it What an extraordinary place. Come, come. You must have visited Hampton Court. Yes, but that's in good order. This seems terribly overgrown. Oh, I've no interest in such things. Uh, can we be quick? It's growing dark. It's odd. The skies were clear enough when we started. There's a storm coming up. Uh, where do you think the tankard was left, Professor? Forgive me, but it does seem rather careless. A valuable antique. Oh, there are reasons, but please hurry. Don't press him yet. Keep back a minute. Listen. I came out early this morning when no one was around and had a good look at your tree. Well, the branch has been sawn through, all right. Are you coming, gentlemen? We must keep in a group. <laughs> you are going altogether too fast, sir. We are not young. Oh, forgive me, but I'm afraid of the storm. This way. James. 
Is there somebody else in the maze? I beg your pardon. Listen. We're being followed. The gardener? The steps are too light for a man. Surely. And they hardly sound like a man at all. Oh, still, I'm trying to listen. The dog, perhaps. Or a cat. No. More like the hopping of an enormous bird. Or even... Oh, damn, we've lost sight of Zetterholm. He went round that corner. Oh, we'd better run. Yes. Oh, Blanche. Which way has he gone? Uh, left or right? Is that a home? Oh, they're here. It's all right. I found the frog tank. Oh, thank okay. goodness. We've got here comes the rain. I'll make for the exit. Uh, Professor. What was that? Now, hurry, we shall be so soon. It's nothing. It's only a frog. Yes, of course, a frog. That's it, a frog. But which way now? <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, uh, Professor. Ah! Oh, dear God, what has happened? Professor! He's quite near. He must be. Is this fast? No, stop. It's this one. I'm sure of it. Well, where are you? Come back. He's over there. No, he isn't. Don't He's behind those hedges. But break the hedge down. You can't. It's too thick. Try the left part. No, that goes back to the exit. Oh, God, I can't stand it screaming. Oh. We've got to do something. Do something. Oh, stop the noise. Where are you? Professor? Where are you, Professor? That when finally we found Professor Zetter home, there was nothing we could do for him. He lay in the center of the maze. He had had, I believe, a heart attack, or so the doctors told us. In any event, he was dead. The frog tankard lay where he had dropped it, a little distance from the body. I brought the object away for certain private reasons I think it wiser not to tell you there is no point in needlessly alarming my audience but I confess the two small points have always puzzled me the heart attack for instance I shouldn't dream of disagreeing with the experts only you see none of them mentioned the curious thin scratches on the man's neck as if made by a claw and then there's the frog tankard. It was definitely a frog tankard when I first saw it, and as such moderately valuable. It is now simply a china mug in a rather disagreeable shade of green. There is nothing inside it, save for a little roughness where some object appears to have broken off. Well, well. Zetterholm may or may not have died of heart failure. One thing is certain. A frog tankard without the frog is of no interest to anybody. Hmm? That was Here Am I, Where Are You by Sheila Hodgson with David March as M. R. James, Lockwood West as Professor Zetterholm, Jonathan Scott as Anne Stick Guthrie, Susan Sheridan as Paul, Ma Paul Mallory, Joan Newell as Mrs. Marriott, and Manning Wilson as the Port.